Um, meeting. Julia Morofchek uh, has spoke to the group in the past about electric vehicles and probably even before then, but that's the talk I'm familiar with. Um, I'll let her talk about her credentials and what she's involved with, um, but she's her talk is on how to green your home. So Julia, I'll take it away. Okay, thank you. So uh, welcome everybody. So um, a little bit about me. Um, so I, um, I uh, as my last talk <laughs> shows, I'm uh, uh, very interested in electric vehicles. Um, so I'm involved in a lot of things having to do with that. So organizations like Cultura and 350 Colorado that do legislation and, um, and uh, Denver Electric Vehicle Council, I'm the events coordinator for them. Um, and uh, I, uh, that, that's just a club basically. And then Drive Clean Colorado is kind of an educational group. Um, so I go to a lot of EV shows. I went to one yesterday. Um, but uh, the thing about electric vehicles, so what I'm really, uh, what I'm really concerned about is climate change, as I think we all are, but that's kind of where I want to devote my, my, my resources. And <clears throat> electric vehicles right now are kind of a done deal in a sense, in that um, the, the number of people who want one is a lot more than, than than the, the production is. So basically there's way more demand than production. So trying to persuade people to get electric vehicles at this point, um, it's fun, but it doesn't actually you know, get any more EVs on the road. And it probably won't for, for several years at least because um, you know, there's bottlenecks having to do with raw materials and battery factories and just legacy automakers ramping up and stuff like that. So I am um, sort of looking around for places where I can make more of a difference. And so I'm moving on to uh, beneficial electrification, um, which is basically you know, making your home as sustainable as possible. And that's, it's kind of where EVs were about five years ago in that um, people don't know much about it. So the average homeowner really doesn't know much about anything they can do. Um, so it's, it's, it's ripe for, you know, for change. I think I can make a lot more difference. So anyway, this is my, um, this is my talk. I'm not, I don't consider myself a true expert at this point because I'm basically sort of trying to get up, get myself, myself up. But uh, the plan is I have some um, friends, uh, some of whom are builders, um, and one of whom has completely redone his home. And we're we're looking to see what we can do with local government or um, training contractors, things like that. So it's kind of my next my next big project. So that's that's where I am right now. Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to start with carbon emissions in general. So this is, um, I really like graphs like this. This is, um, so, um, so, so this is a graph of how, where our carbon emissions come from in general. So the nice thing about this is you can look at it and it's a little daunting, but then you can say, okay, if we get all of these sectors here dealt with, then we're most of the way there, which is which is kind of nice. So um, so you can see where buildings are there. So buildings make up 20% of carbon emissions. Um, transportation is 25%. So if you get an EV, um, then you're you know taking that out. Uh, if you if you electrify your building and make it as 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 efficient as possible, then you're dealing with the buildings. That yellow part there is oil and gas, so they that's kind of you're also helping that as well. <clears throat> now let's look more. Let's zoom in a little bit at the average American's carbon emissions here. So you can see that between home heating and cooling and other home energy use, that's really the 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 bulk of what your what your emissions come from. Transportation, once again, is there on the other side. Um, food, you know, you can 
eat lower in the food chain and things like that. But basically we will right now be focusing on the home eating and cooling and other home energy use. And if you work on that, then you can get a third or so of your energy, um, the carbon emissions down. Okay, so where does the CO2 emissions from buildings come from? I'm gonna focus on the, on the, uh, the graph on the right there, residential. So you can see that space heating and cooling is 38%. So most of your, most of your uh, CO2 emissions in your home come from space heating and cooling. Water heating is kind of a big chunk, 15%. Then there's um, cooking appliances, electronics, lighting, it's 24%, and then other, who knows what other is. But um, that kind of gives you an idea. If you want to lower your carbon footprint, where you can be where you can be putting it. Okay, so there's this, there's a sort of phrase that people in the sustainability area say, which is electrify everything. Um, so it's just kind of a stock phrase. And the idea behind it is that if we want to, as a country, as a world, as a species, get to zero emissions, two big steps are to, first of all, make everything electric, and then secondly, switch to 100% renewable energy. So if everything is electric and we're getting that electricity from 100% renewable, then that brings us a lot of the way there. So there's certain things like agriculture and whatever, concrete, cement, things like that. But we're, we're a lot of the way there. So that will, be, um, that will be a lot of what this is about, is how to, how to ch change your home to completely electric. So let me talk about natural gas. Um, so that's what we have in this part of the country as our alternative to electricity for our homes as far as energy. Um, so natural gas is mostly methane. You can pretty much think of it as, as methane. Now methane is, um, as far as how it compares to CO2 in, um, in, in global warming potential, it's actually much worse as far as um, how much it warms the planet. So 28 times what CO2 does. So, um, so it's, it, it's it, the advantage of it is it breaks down faster than CO2, but it, it has a huge, um, a huge effect on global warming. Now, um, another problem with natural gas is pipe leaks. So that's something that they, every time they look at this, it seems like there's more and more pipe leaks that they didn't know about. So they'll look at it with a satellite and say, oh my God, there's more than we thought. Um, so the pipe leaks of their thinking of natural gas in this country are, is the equivalent of, I think it was a half a million cars. So this is just natural gas that leaks out of pipes as it goes, get, goes along. Now it'll also leak into your house. So that gets us into the toxic part here. So three quarters of the uh, natural gas that goes into your house actually goes into it when your uh, stove or whatever it is, is not on. So it's just these, these leaks that sort of happen over time. And there are um, there are health effects associated with that, so uh, respiratory problems, um, cancer, there because there's benzene in there as well. So um, it's not good for you, and it's not good for the planet. Okay, so I'm going to go through all the steps that I have here to green your home. There are probably some that I missed, but this is kind of what I have here. So the first one is seal and insulate your home. The second one is install a heat pump. The third one is install an electric hot, uh, hot water heater. Step four is switch to electric landscaping equipment. Step five is switch to uh, induction or an electric stove. Induction is electric, but either one. Uh, step six is switch your light bulbs to LEDs and use energy efficient appliances. And step seven, is, which is hidden under my little thing here, install solar or get electricity from solar and wind. So get your electricity from renewables. So I'm gonna talk about these one at a time. Okay, so I'm gonna start with sealing and insulating your home. Now, I know this sounds kind of boring, um, but 
everybody, if you if you go and ask people, they say this is the first thing you want need to do, and this may be the most impactful as well. So um, if you added up all the leaks in your home, and if you have an average home, it's it's, it's equivalent to leaving a window open 365 days a year. So you can imagine, I mean, if you do accidentally leave a window open in the winter, which I have done, you can feel how much impact that has. Um, so nine and nine out of 10 homes in the United States are under insulated. So even if you had insulation, Put in and it was good after a while it just it, it starts getting getting bad over time um and, and one nice thing about this is that it really is cost effective so this is sort of a, a in general not a particularly expensive thing to do um but you'll get your money back because you won't have that window open okay so um epa estimates that homeowners can save 15% on healing and cool, heating and cooling costs um, by air sealing their homes and adding insulation in attics, floors, or crawl, crawl spaces and basements. Um, if you have a, a attached garage, that's a place where a lot of times, depending on when your home was built, they didn't put any insulation there. So if you have a room that's right next to a garage or above a garage and it's cold in the winter, Probably no insulation. So that's a, that's another kind of big bang for your buck thing there. Okay, another advantage of doing this is that you have a more comfortable house. So a lot of people will have homes where there's a room that gets cold in the winter and hot in the summer, and um, it just is just not comfortable. And you want to have a comfortable house. You're gonna, you know, it feels more like home. Um, Reduce noise from outside. So those, those gaps also let in noise. Just let I me mean, imagine having your window open. Um, less pollen, dust, insects, and mice, rats entering your home. Um, this area has a lot of mice and rats, I've noticed. So <laughs> that's definitely an advantage. Um, better humidity control um, and lower chance for ice dams and snowy climates. Okay, so how do you go about doing this? First of all, do you even really need to do it? Um, so you, uh, the first step is to have an expert evaluate your home. So have somebody come in, look for leaks in uh, poorly insulated areas. So they'll do a complete assessment. They'll use a thermal camera and, and, and figure out whether, whether you really have a problem. You might not have a problem, but you might have, there might be walls that aren't insulated. Um, foundations often you know you build your home and then after a while you know the foundation settles so cracks appear and things like that so there are a lot of places where you can have um you can have leaks that come in so then make the decision if your home needs additional work and then have a have a expert seal it insulate it and then use rebates i'm going to say this with every single one um and um i i did not do the i did not Look, um, I don't have a list of rebates for every single one of these, but every single thing you do on your home um, with regard to sustainability it, it has a rebate somewhere. So rebates, I would look at um, federal rebates. So the Inflation Reduction Act is coming out hopefully next uh, in next year. Um, so that has extra money. So you might want to wait until then. Um, so federal government rebates, um, state rebates. So Colorado may have some. And then your uh, energy company. So whether it's Excel or one of the others, they often have rebates or some kind of incentive programs as well. OK, heating and cooling your house. So I'm going to talk about heat pumps here. Um, so what is a heat pump? Okay, so as you remember from physics class, energy is not created or destroyed. So if you put a unit of energy into something, you're going to get a unit of energy out. So if you put a unit of, ele of electricity, gas, whatever, into heating your house, at most you're going to get that same unit of energy heating your house. You know, it, once you once you take it from the wall and put it into the device, you'll get the same amount of energy. You aren't gonna get more unless it's magic, right? 
Well, heat pumps are kind of magic in that you actually do get more. And the reason is you aren't creating energy. So you're not like if you plugged in a, a, a heater, um, you know, a resist, standard resistive heater that, that turns orange, you're taking that energy and, and putting it directly into heating. But what heat pumps do is they just take heat from one place to another. So if, uh, if you're, you want to heat up your house, it, it takes heat from outside, even if the outside is 30 degrees or zero degrees, there's still heat there, it's not absolute zero. So they take heat from out there and put it in your house. And vice versa, if you wanna cool your house, it takes the heat from inside your house and puts it outside your house. So then you have the magic of having three or four times more efficient. So for every unit of energy you put in, you get three units of, of heat transferred either, either in or out. Um, now you actually have heat pumps in your house that you don't know about. Um, so uh, uh, air conditioner is a heat pump. Um, so it's basically doing that. Um, it's putting the, it's putting the heat from your house outside. And if you go to the, your outside unit, it'll be warm. And that's the, that's the heat going out. Another one you have is your refrigerator. So your refrigerator does the same thing. It takes heat from inside the refrigerator and puts it outside the refrigerator. And that's why, you know, there's no net, net cooling or heating of a refrigerator, you know, because it's just taking it from you know, of your house because it's just taking it from the inside and putting it on the outside. So it's just basically the same principle. It's a principle we've known forever. Um, and basically, if you have a heat pump in your house, it's kind of like having an air conditioner, which most of us have, um, but it's going two ways. So same principle as the air conditioner, but two ways, forward and back. So what's What's the benefits of heat pumps? Okay, first of all, they run on electricity. So if you want to electrify everything, a heat pump is the way to go. There are no toxic gases. So you don't have a gas furnace that is leaking and possibly causing health problems. Um, it replaces both your furnace and your air conditioner. So basically you have a simpler system, which is kind of nice. You don't have to maintain two devices. Um, and in general, heat pumps require less maintenance than, say, even a furnace. Um, they're very quiet. Um, they will lower your energy bill, as you can pretty much guess from the fact that they're so efficient. Um, <clears throat> they clean the air very well. Um, they adjust humidity. Probably not too much of an issue around here. Um, they have a smaller carbon footprint, which is um, because they're more efficient a lot, sort of like EVs. I mean, EVs are, you know, if you have a 130 mile per gallon equivalent car versus a 30 mile per hour uh, or a 30 mile um, miles per gallon uh, car, then, you know, the, 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 the more efficient one is better. Um, they work to um, they work to negative ten degrees. So this is something I want to stress, and the reason I want to stress this is because contractors in the HVAC world are uh, kind of anti heat pump, and they're also um, not they don't necessarily keep up to date on things. So a lot of them will say, "Oh, they only heat to ten degrees, not minus, but ten degrees." So you don't want one. Um, uh, and the reason they're saying that is that until recently they did. So the, the, the um, technology of heat pumps has improved a lot um, recently. So, uh, so just be aware if you talk to somebody and they say, oh, you can't do that in Colorado. Not true, because the latest, the newest ones will work to, you know, less than what, what you need around here. Rebates once again. So there are rebates I know in the Inflation Reduction Act and um, Excel has rebates. I don't know if Colorado does, but I don't think it would. Um, maybe your county too. I mean, just check everywhere. Okay, so there are some drawbacks of heat pumps. Um, if you don't need to replace both your furnace and your air conditioner, then it can be costly. Um, there are somewhere, some houses where it, they don't really work, and, the, and those would be houses that are, you know, old and big and leaky. Then you might not be able to get enough 
heat from a heat pump to to deal with it. Because if there's a lot of if there's a lot of cold coming in, then basically the heat pump kind of has to fight that. Um, they are, even though they can, um, they can heat at low temperatures. They're less efficient. So the three to three, uh, three to four times to one ratio, um, as you get as the temperature goes down, that ratio gets less and less. And the reason is that there's just less heat out there to bring in, so it has to work harder to get that heat in. Um, there may be a few days a year that you, you'll need, depending on your house again, that you might need supplementary heating, so you might not want to plug in a, one of those little heater things or, or something like that. And then uh, you have to find an experienced installer, and I want to warn people about um, installers in that, and I kind of alluded to this already, that the HVAC world is pretty ignorant about these, and as a result, I mean, they don't know Quite frankly, they don't know how to assess a building and they don't know how to install these things. They're more complicated than just a furnace. So as a result, they may try to talk you out of it. Now, not all of them are like that. You just have to find the ones that um, you just have to find the ones that know what they're doing. And one of the things we're trying to do, me and my friends, is trying to create education programs so we have more people who know how to how to do this. HVAC people also tend to be fairly conservative and some of them are sort of anti anything that you know environmental just on principle. Okay so there are two kinds of heat pumps. Um, there are two kinds of heat pumps. One um, is one that uses your ducts so these big pipes here that that take the heat and cool through your house and ones that don't. So the ones that don't are called mini splits. So I'm gonna talk about both of them one at a time. So the ducted heat pump, basically you can use what you have in your house already as far as your ducts. And you just replace your furnace with this thing, with the heat pump. And um, it has a central location and it just uses the existing duct system. Now that might be, good or that might be bad depending on your duct system. So if your duct system is old and leaky and nasty, then you may not want to do it this way because then you probably have to repair it or or else you're, you're gonna, I mean, you're gonna be spending a little bit more money. I mean, and you probably already are. But um, um, <clears throat> the other one is called mini splits. So you can see kind of on this picture here, there's this little thing on the wall with the blue arrow and the and the red, red arrow. So these are put on walls and um, they can be used independently. So each room that they're in or area that they're in can have a different temperature. Um, and that's actually can be an advantage um, for, for several reasons. First of all, sometimes your house, like, like I have a very, I have a three-story house that's a townhouse and it's very small and, and, uh, and tall. So the um, so the um, the heat tends to go up. So um, so that's an advantage there. And then you may have people in your home that like different temperatures. So you can have like a, a mini split in two bedrooms next to each other. One person has it on heat, and one person has it on air conditioning. You know, if you if you really really want to. So you can have sort of individual preferences. You don't have to argue over over whether it should get hotter or colder. So they are like your air conditioner. They are um, attached to an outdoor unit. Um, now the 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 they're, they're more efficient actually than the ducted ones because you do no matter how nice your ducts are that you usually lose some kind of efficiency pumping air through there. Um, uh, so they're more efficient, but the disadvantage is that you have this thing thing on your wall and. It's not ugly, but it's not, you know, it looks kind of functional. So some people don't like that. You can actually uh, put, they, there are companies that will put art over it or, or you know, you can hang like a, some fabric, decorative fabric or something. So there are ways of getting around that, but that is, that's kind of their main advantage. I got to talk about geothermal. So, um, and Probably not something that any of us will do, but uh, but but maybe, and it's it's something that that people talk about. So I just kind of want to acquaint people. So 
With a regular heat pump, you're taking air from outside, cooling it or heating it. Uh, now, if the air is out, outside is zero degrees, then you're going to take a lot of energy to heat it up to what you like, 70 degrees. Um, and if the heat outside is 100, 95 or whatever, then it's going to take a fair amount of energy to get it back down to the 70. But the ground is always about 55 to 60 degrees. So, um, so in general, you'll probably be using, if you had air that was always 55 to 60 degrees, you wouldn't really be using as much energy. So the idea behind a geothermal system is that you bury um, coolant lines in the ground and those coolant lines, once they're buried deep enough, are 55 to 60 degrees. So, um, so you, your system doesn't have to work as hard and um, you can save energy. Um, they are, however, expensive because somebody has to dig that big, big huge thing and put it in. Um, it, they can be less expensive if you're already digging up the ground. So if you're putting in a driveway or something like that, then, um, then um, you know, that, that could be a time to do it. Um, another thing people will do is, is share the, um, share the heat pump with neighbors. So if you have four, four, uh, four houses in a block, so you've got like your house and then you have your next door neighbor and then you have people behind your backyard and then you have the people kitty corner to that, you can all use the same, heat, uh, same geothermal system. So that is something that people do sometimes as well. Um, it's also less expensive if you have a big house just because, um, you know, you, you've got more air to deal with or you've got more area to deal with, so it might be worth it to do something like that. Generally, what they're good at, good for, um, is, you know, apartment buildings or, um, um, you know, commercial buildings and things like that. Okay, so let's go on to heating your, heating your water. Okay, so let me talk about heat pump hot water heaters. So uh, heat pumps can also be used for hot water. So same thing, they basically just take the heat from outside the hot water heater and put it in the hot water heater. Um, they are two to three times more energy efficient than a standard hot water heater. And um, Energy Star, I think most people know about Energy Star, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, Energy Star qualified models can save 300 annually on electric bills. So how much do they cost? They cost more than a conventional one. They cost about $1,000 or so. Um, and a conventional one costs $300. But if you're saving $300 annually, that's pretty good. You know, I mean, you're definitely going to be out ahead if you use something like this. Um, one problem is that heat pumps, it's difficult for them to heat quickly. So a lot of them will have a resistive heating in their element in there just to just to quickly heat heat water if you need to. Rebates, rebates, rebates. So uh, if you if it's a thousand dollars but you have a $250 rebate, then you know it's even less. So Julie, can I stop you for a second? You there can. A questions. Sure. Um, Rick had asked um, about comparison to tankless water heaters. Um, what about as compared to tankless water heaters? I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't have. It's a good point, and 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 I should have added that here. So I don't have like a comparison. So that would have to be something, unfortunately, that you do yourself because I can't rattle that off my head. But yeah, that's another thing to look into. He asked about um, coal used to create electric vehicles too, but maybe that's not really on this topic, but that was early. I can, I can address that, sure. Okay, so he read that a lot of coal is used to create an electric uh, vehicle, mining lithium, et cetera, and that you won't be ahead of overall emissions with a gas vehicle for two to three years, which is fine, but there are many considerations when estimating total CO production. Yeah, uh, so, so I mean, that's, that's a good point. And it would be actually applicable here. I mean, in, in Colorado right now, we have 40% coal. Um, and if you're gonna electrify your home, you're electrifying your home with coal to a certain extent, I mean, not a lot. Right. So a couple, of, a couple of responses to that. First of all, um, these, 
these like a heat pump and a uh, electric vehicle um, are both like I kind of alluded to before much more efficient. So it's not just that they're using a different form of energy. It's also that they're using way less of it. So as far as an electric vehicle, electric vehicle will use like a four, four times less, less energy in general to make itself go. Um, so even if, if, you, if your electric vehicle ran on entirely coal, which I don't think there's any place in the country that's entirely coal, but entirely coal, it still would eke out ahead as far as putting, putting gas in it um, because of the efficiency. Gas, gas and oil refine, well, the whole process of gas and oil actually uses a lot of electricity too. I have heard, but I don't really want to say this is definite because I have not fact checked it and I did try and I couldn't find, but I have heard that the amount of, if you, the amount of, of electricity that is used in the whole process of getting gas into your car from the very, very start is the same as an electric vehicle. So basically, you know, the gas takes as much electricity for the whole process of mining it and refining it and this and that as an electric vehicle. However, I have not fact checked that. So I don't, you know, I, I like to fact check it. So anyway, um, uh, as far as mining, um, I mean, mining is it, for for uh, electric vehicle batteries is, um, you know, it's it's an extra thing that you don't have with gas cars. But the thing is, you're also mining for oil. And that is just oh, way more, once again, because I mean, once you have a battery, you have a battery. But but gas, you have to put in your car all the time. And the the, the devastation as far as ecosystems and this and that are, are, are way worse with, with gas um, than, than a, a, you know, lithium, whatever else is in there, um, depending on your battery chemistry. Um, so EV batteries, a lot of them are, are nickel um, cobalt, and both of those are a little controversial because they're, um, they, um, they're fairly scarce. And, and then cobalt has this thing where it's it's mined in a country that that uses child labor, even though probably the, the ones that the cobalt that goes into the batteries don't. But still, people don't like that. However, electric vehicles are changing over to a new uh, battery chemistry, which I have, which is lithium iron phosphate. Iron, well, that's why the flat irons are red, right? I mean, iron is everywhere. Um, uh, phosphate, a little harder to get, but um, but not that bad. I mean, your your gas car is made out of iron too, because it's got stainless steel. So um, lithium really isn't that big of a deal as far. I mean, it's not it's not great, but it's not the mining of it is not really that bad. Um, it tends to either be pumped brine, um, which is just pumping salty water from the ground and then taking out the lithium. The only problem with that is it uses a lot of water. So you can be in an area where you're using a lot of water, but otherwise it's pretty good compared to almost all other mining. Or it uses um, old old uh, seabeds and basically salt flats. Um, so it'll take those, take that rock and, and take the lithium out. The thing about that is there's no ecosystem there because nothing can survive on salt flats really. So you're not, I mean, they might look, look ugly, but that's about it. They are moving um, towards sodium ion phosphate batteries. So there are some out there for stationary storage. Um, and really they seem to be just as good as lithium, except uh, they just don't have as much research behind it. So people are just a little, you know, leery of, of just sort of taking it on, but that's probably going to be a future. So anyway, kind of a trans, kind of a um, going off, but, um, is there, are there any other? No, uh, at this time. Okay, let's, cool. let's move on. And if I don't show up, we'll... I have a quick comment, oh. which is I like this uh, in the summer because it's going to cool your house down slightly. That's actually true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so great in the winter because then you have to produce, put heat into the house from something. Right, yeah. That's a good point is that the heat is not going outside um, or the, sorry, the cold is not going outside. It's going into your, into, to wherever you are, wherever that thing is. So you can't necessarily stick it like in a little closet or something because then you're going to be 
freezy in that closet. But um, but yeah, it, it does have an added advantage in the in the um, summer. Well, let me ask the group out, outside. Do you have any other questions at this time? Anyone out online? If no one does, but you know, we'll have time at the end too, or other other stops in the talk. So I'll let Julia. Okay, I just want to make one mention, okay, because architecture and engineering was the first thing I studied. Um, and I think, That's more me. excuse me? Oh, sorry, I'm just saying you probably know way more than I do. <laughs> no, 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 I think uh, technology has improved since, you know, I'm archaic, you know, I mean, that was a long time ago. But even at that time, we were looking at passive geothermal design incorporating it into the design of the building. Now, I know that's very hard to change the whole marketing system of the American home. Very, very difficult. But if a, ho a house is designed properly to begin with, many of the things you're talking about are already incorporated into, into it, plus geothermal design. Um, I wish we could go in that direction, but I think that's a bit too much of a battleship to turn around at this time. Yeah, I mean, you're making that's all I want to say. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I'm not talking about any. Um, I, I mean, I could have, but I, I, I am, am not in this talk talking about any, any kind of. Um, I mean, in many ways, you could build a home to be, um, you know, a passive home, a green home where you really don't need much or even any sometimes. Um, uh, heating or cooling. Um, I want to, as long as we're, as long as that kind of like makes me want to talk about this thing here. So I'll just interrupt myself here. So there is on on uh, October first. Can you tell me whether this is this? Because <laughs> I can't see myself. Well, yeah, let's hold it up a little higher. There you go. Okay. So on October first, there's this really cool thing which I have partaken of a couple of times. It's a green homes tour. So basically, you, you start at this place, and then you have uh, people with electric vehicles, including me, I've done it, uh, will take you on a little tour from house to house. And these are, these are like serious, hardcore people, green home people. So these are not people who are just doing what I'm doing. These are people who are doing really innovative, interesting things. And it's, it's quite fascinating. Even if you don't have any intention of doing anything, it's just fun to see what these people have done a lot of them are very creative so you can like take a screenshot or something like that of this or if we could just maybe you could type it into the chat later on you yeah. don't have to do it now but before we end maybe, yeah i'll, maybe I'll type, type, the, type the link in i see there's a link yeah yeah i'll do that or, okay great thank you yeah, yeah i have a yeah. question too but I'll, i could say until the end okay if you hear me i mean you can ask it now if you want or you can save it to the end well, okay, um, I gotta ask, okay, um, at least one of them. Um, if, if, okay, talking about sealing up your house they, to keep you know, any air leaks out, is there a risk of suffocation if you seal your house too much? Like, yeah, I mean, I mean a, a couple of things there. First of all, it's probably hard to seal so much that you'll actually suffocate. You could, maybe seal enough so that the carbon dioxide gets higher in your home. If that's a concern, you can actually put in a system that will bring in, it's another kind of like, it's a heat exchange kind of thing. So it will bring in fresh air from your outside, completely filter it. So, so this makes your home extremely clean. Completely filter it, but have it like uh, go go next to some pipes, which will heat it up as it comes in. So um, what's it called? It's an acronym that begins with R. I, I can't quite remember. But anyway, you can you can do that if you want. OK. I'll say rather question for, for after. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I mention just something here about that when Titan yeah, switched? When they were starting to be designed a few decades ago, this problem was encountered. And anyone who's going to design that, well, it's a tight home, really, you know, basically no infiltration, 
uh, uh, or zero infiltration. They came up with design features that would alleviate that problem. So there's really no more danger in having a tight home as long as there are these ventilation design features within that home. And it's actually worth it. It's really kind of very passive design features that uh, can be incorporated. So that problem has been addressed a while ago in design. Okay, great. Right. All right, well, let's let Julia move on and we'll have time for questions later. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about landscaping equipment. So landscaping equipment is something that people don't think about much with regard to their home, but it has a in very high carbon footprint. So here's some things that are sort of startling. One hour of lawnmower use is the equivalent of driving your gas car 300 miles from Los Angeles to, to, to uh, Las Vegas. Um, where's my cursor? One hour of leaf blower usage is, is the same as driving 1,100 miles from Denver to LA. So these two-stroke engines, they look small, they look like they're not doing much, but they have an incredible um, carbon footprint, unfortunately. Um, okay. Um, so uh, if you, switch over your lawnmower. There, there are electric equivalents to all of them. There are electric lawnmowers, there's electric uh, leaf blowers, there's electric... There are also four-stroke engines for those. A lot of four-stroke engine gas lawnmower 25 years ago. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's partly the two-stroke four... Part of it is that they just don't have the I mean, cars by law have to have a bunch of things in them to clean and make sure this, and, and you can't really do that on a lawnmower. It would just be too prohibitively expensive, but yeah, you can probably get better or worse, but they're, ne they're never good. <laughs> um, okay, so, so advantages. Um, your total cost of ownership is gonna be less um, and mostly because of fuel costs, but also because of maintenance costs. So a gas, gas Push mower overall, total cost of ownership $1.50 per half acre, a corded electric push mower 50 cents, and a cordless electric push mower is 10 cents per half acre. So quite quite a few, quite a, um, a savings there. Um, they have practically no maintenance. Maintenance on these things is a pain. Um, you don't have to go to the gas station with your little thing and bring it back home in your car and have your car stink afterwards and, and then store it in your you know, whatever, store it in your garage and have a fire and who knows what. Um, they're very quiet, so your neighbors will love you. Um, and there actually are many places around the country who are banning uh, these gas powered lawn equipments, not for sustainability reasons, but because people really are, we're tired of getting woken up at seven in the morning on a Saturday with these really, really, really loud, um, loud, things. And the people that use them also, I mean, they have to have ear protection, but even with ear protection, they, over time, they'll get, they'll get hearing damage. They're very loud. Um, no unhealthy fumes. So once you can, um, if you are using one, or if, even if you hire some landscaping um, uh, business to come over and do it, you know, you're basically hiring, paying money for this person to be breathing fumes, which, you know, is kind of an ethical issue, I think. Um, they're easy to turn on, flip, you know, I mean, I, I guess lawnmowers, you don't go around anymore, I don't think, but, you know, they're much easier to turn on. Rebates, rebates, rebates. So um, once again, um, go to, you know, looking for federal re rebates, state rebates, uh, power company rebates, whatever, city, county, just look for whatever there is. Okay, cooking your food. Okay, I'm gonna talk about induction stoves. Now, there are electric stoves that are not induction stoves. And actually, I'll talk about them for a second here. So electric stoves, when I think of an electric stove as opposed to a gas stove, I think of those little ones with the coils that are never quite flat and, you know, and it takes forever to boil water and things like that. Well, electric stoves, even if they're not induction, have come a long way. And they can actually be extremely fast cooking. So they basically can, can put a lot of power into the element if you want it. 
So any kind of electric stove is actually, you know, if you have a, you know, bias against electric stoves because you've had awful ones in the past, um, they're, they've come a long way. But I'm gonna talk about induction stoves here. So um, induction stoves, not sure exactly how they work, but they use, they use a magnet to create uh, heat somehow. Someone probably knows what it is. What is it? I think they're inducing a current in the pan. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Of yeah, you have, work with yeah, you have to have magnetic co cookware. It has to be ferric, iron or steel, okay. I think. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, I'll get to that when we get to disadvantages. Um, but they are very fast cooking. So boiling water from gas takes 10 to 15 minutes. Induction takes two to three minutes. So it's whatever, five times as fast. No toxic gas because they're electric. Um, they're 84% more energy efficient than, than gas stoves. So once again, um, even if it were 100% coal, you, you know, it was using 100% electric, uh, electricity from coal, the fact that they're more energy efficient is really what um, what gives your 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 low carbon footprint there. Um, they cook better, so top chefs are now using induction. They're not using gas. So the whole that whole phrase, cooking with gas, well, we just have to get rid of that or or change it to cooking with induction. Um, so you need to have the right cookware. That's true. So if you um, if you don't have uh, if you don't have magnetic cookware and you can just stick a magnet on the bottom of your cookware to see whether it is, then that's an extra expense you have to consider because you're going to have to you're going to have to buy all new um, uh, all new um, cookware rebates. There are rebates for them as well. Okay, costs. I'm going to talk about cost. So I was under the impression before I kind of I didn't know a lot about induction stoves before I made this 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 deck here. And my impression was that they were expensive and I think they used to be, but really when I went to price them, they were pretty much the same as gas. So I said they were expensive and then I said comparable to gas because I did not, you know, it was surprising to me. But here's the weird thing is that you can go to Amazon and you can get a, a highly rated portable induction cooktop um, burner. So basically this is just a one burner um, and you plug it into the wall on your 110 outlet and then you can boil your water in two minutes or do whatever else you want. Um, and it costs like 50 bucks. It costs about 50, you know, 50 bucks. So if you had four of those, you would have kind of the equivalent of an induction stove, but you'd be paying $200. So why is it that these are so cheap and the stoves are so expensive. Well, I kind of went to try to find out that answer. And there were a lot, there was a lot of kind of talk in Reddit asking that same question, but I didn't get like a like a formal answer. So people were saying, well, you know, maybe it's just economies of scale or who knows. But I just want to say that if you don't want to go all the way and get an induction stove because your stove is fine, this is another option is to just simply get one of these these things and just use it alongside your stove as a, as an, as a kitchen appliance. Okay, I have to say something. I have to make a plug for Boulder Atheist. You buy it on Amazon, get it through Am Boulder Atheist Smile account. You get a kickback on that. Okay. There you go. Awesome. All right. Okay, lighting your home and low energy appliances. So this is step six here. So this is basically the stuff that you plug in, make sure it doesn't have a, take a lot of electricity. So I'll talk about LED lights. I would think that now most people have LED lights. I mean, they've been around for so long and they're so cheap, um, but I'm gonna talk about them anyway. So lighting in general accounts for 5% of global CO2 emissions. Um, and you have an energy savings of about 50 to 75% if you change to LED. Um, Excel, once again, rebates, well, not really rebates, but discounts anyway. So Excel, believe it or not, has, has discounts on these. And I've actually, so I do EV shows and sometimes Excel is there um, with their little booth. And they actually give out these big, huge boxes of free LED lights. I mean, with like, I don't know, 20 lights in there. Um, so I, I went online to try to see whether you can order one of those and I didn't, but 
Um, but anyway, Excel is your friend when it comes to LED lights, apparently. Um, then I'll just go mom for a minute and say, turn off the lights when you leave the room. So, um, so I think that's just a habit. So some people just, when they, go, when, they, when they come home, the entire house is lit up until they go to bed. And then other people, you know, when they leave a room, it's just, you know, they don't even think about it. You know, they just sort of walk. So if you can, if you can get that habit, that's, that's good. That's what your mom says. Okay, low energy appliances. So Energy Star, so um, I think people probably know what Energy Star is, but basically it's a program from the government that sort of rates appliances based on how little energy they use. So if you if you're a refrigerator or something like that, and it's not using a lot of electricity, it's very efficient, it'll get an Energy Star rating there. Um, Excel. What is it? Oh, Excel has some stuff with energy. I, I think it has some kind of a, a uh, rebates or some sort of thing having to do with Energy Star and low energy appliances. So that's another place to go. I don't know about if you don't have Excel. I don't know what your energy company does. I have Excel, so that's what I kind of kind of use. But go go to your energy company and and look for that as well. Um, okay, so here's another mom thing. Unplug your appliances that aren't being used. So, um, so a lot of times people will just keep their things plugged in. They aren't on, so they aren't taking any energy. Well, that's not necessarily true. So um, they uh, often are taking a little bit of energy, even if they aren't on. So, uh, uh, use one one easy way to do this is to use power strips and then just turn the power strips off and on now if that's too much of a pain which it is a little bit you can, there are actually this is once again on amazon and i think right boulder atheists don't they have some kind of a yeah we got really buy it through our smile account smile account okay so, <laughs> okay so uh so anyway, um, you can get power strips that actually have a timer on them. This interesting one, this was the first one I found in, um, uh, this was the first one I found on Amazon. So it was kind of top rated. So it has this interesting thing where, where four, of these, uh, four of these are on the timer and four of them aren't. So that's kind of cool because there may be some things you just want, want to have on all the time or plugged in all the time on ones that don't. But anyway, that's kind of an easy way to do it. You just buy it and then set the timer and you don't have to think about it. Uh, you know, just have it go off at night. Phone chargers and other chargers will use energy when they aren't charging anything. So if you have a phone charger plugged into the wall, I, I, don't, I have an old phone, so it still like has to be plugged in. Um, so if you have, have one there and it's not doing anything, it's still taking a little bit of energy there. Turn off your computers. Computers are huge as far as um, how much energy they use. And then also computers really are not meant to be on all the time. They're not really made for that. So it's it'll it'll reduce the life of your computer by a lot. I looked at this a long time ago and it was like it, it reduces their lifespan in half. Um, now, that might not be the case anymore because I think they're better now at sort of hibernating and this and that. But it's still, you know, computers are expensive. You, you want to you wanna have them last a long time. Um, save on uh, carbon emissions, of course. That's what we care about. Um, you're also not heating your home in the, in the summer. So if you have all these things on, they're bringing in electricity. But of course, electricity, if it's not used for anything else, eventually turns into heat. So it'll basically be heating up your house. Rebates, rebates, rebates. Okay. Okay. So I'm now uh, step seven. Uh, I think that's our last step. Renewable energy. So once again, the idea is electrify everything, and then so we don't have to worry about this coal issue. Um, use renewables for your electricity. Um, so if you want to power your home with renewables, there are two things you can do. First of all, you can install rooftop solar. I suppose you can put in a wind turbine, but um, I'll do that. Install rooftop solar, or you can enroll in a renewable energy program where you get 
you basically get your your electricity from renewables. Now you don't actually get it from renewables. You're kind of offsetting it, um, but still. Because you, you have solar panels and be enrolled. And yes, and I'm actually doing that. Yeah. Um, so rooftop solar. Um, so these are some. It's good to get install rooftop solar if you are getting a new roof. So if you're getting a new roof, this is a great time to do it. And the reason is that if you have an old roof and you put in solar, when you want to get a new roof, you have to take the solar off. So that's kind of, you know, that's kind of a pain and, and costs some money. But if you're getting a brand new roof, then you can put solar on it and, you know, then, then you don't have to go through that because um, roofs last a long time. And then um, you have to make sure that your roof is getting sunlight. Um, so not all roofs can, can use solar at this point, because if your roof is pointing north or if there's big trees over it or something like that, it's just, you're not gonna get, it's just not worth it. So, um, so it's not for everybody, but it's for most people. Um, so is it worth it? So is it cost effective to get a, get solar panels put in? Well, there's several ways you can do that. First of all, you can use online solar estimators. So just go and Google that, and then you can kind of get an immediate idea of um, uh, whether it's worth it. And then you can also get estimates from solar companies. Now, I know people don't want, you know, people are kind of afraid of having people come in and, and try to sell them solar. But I did that and I got like three estimates and they were nice. I mean, they never didn't hard sell me. Um, you know, they would just, They'd look online using Google Maps and kind of see my roof and then um, give me kind of that would be kind of the first step. And then they come in and talk to me and look at the look at the roof, you know, and they weren't hard sell at all. Um, I did get solar. I did get solar on my roof and uh, the company I work for, I work for the company I, I, I got it um, from also has battery storage and they kind of assessed my situation and said it wouldn't be worth it to get battery storage. So that kind of tells me that, you know, they're not just, just gonna sell you things just to make money there. You can also lease. So that's something to look at. Um, so if you don't want to, um, if you don't want to have, you know, put up the money immediately, you can lease your solar panels and you can basically do this thing where the, look at your power company, where the power company will basically kind of use your roof as a way of them getting power. So you're still, you're still making a contribution in the same way. I mean, there's still, you know, renewable that wouldn't be there before, um, but basically the power company is kind of um, putting it up and um, using, your, using your roof there. Lots of rebates. Um, and next year there will be more. Okay, so let me talk about enrolling in a renewable energy program. So once again, I only know Excel, but look at your own. Um, so Excel has something called WinSource here. So um, I'm on it, are you on it? Yeah. Um, so WinSource, it says WinSource, but it's really wind and solar source. Um, so basically you, you pay a little extra per month and I mean, I think I pay like a few bucks or something like that. I already have solar, so it's just kind of the cover the cover the rest. Um, but I think at most it's like ten bucks or something like that a month. And then um, and then basically you you know the amount of electricity you use is offset by by wind and solar. So um, so you're not going to make any money on that, but you'll have the knowledge that for really not much money you're you know now you don't have to you know, think about how much coal Colorado uses. Okay, so so storage, um, energy storage. So this is another option if you have solar panels. I mean, I guess you can get it if you don't have solar panels as well. Um, so basically this is just a big, huge battery, just like a battery in an EV only, you know, might be a little bit different because it doesn't have to be light. But, um, and what it does is it stores energy from your solar panels. So solar panels, you know, work during the day and people are often gone during the day. So the time when you're really making the most electricity is not the time when you're using the most electricity necessarily. You're probably using it at night and maybe in the morning when you wake up. 
So um, currently what you do in that case is you just sell your extra solar power to the power company, but you don't, they don't give you a huge amount for it. So it is sometimes cost effective to get a storage battery and then take all that extra energy, put it in the battery, and then you can use it when, um, you know, for cheap when you, when you need it. Um, it's also a lot of people will get it for this reason. I'm not, I don't really care if the power goes out, to be honest, but um, um, <laughs> worst that can happen if, is I can lose my food in my refrigerator. But a lot of people are really um, concerned about that. And some people have real needs that, you know, medical needs or who knows what. So uh, it is a protection against power outages. So it's basically like a same, same thing as the gen, not the same thing as a generator, but the same use as a generator. So if you have a generator that you keep around just in case of power, power outages, this is a better, less smelly way of, of doing the same thing. Um, and once again, you can use online calculators or, or ask your solar installer to see if it's worth it. Rebates, rebates, rebates. Um, Excel has something called Battery Connect. So this is a way of, so what, a big thing power companies do is they try to make it so that the, the amount of electricity doesn't go up and that's being used doesn't go up and down like this. The reason is that if it goes up, they have to like take electricity out. If it goes down, they have to like quickly fire up some kind of a power source, coal or who knows what, natural gas usually, and then make it go up. And that's expensive sometimes extremely expensive and it's just it's just hard so that's like 90 percent of what a power company does as far as i'm as far as i can see so what they what if you have one of these storage batteries they will actually pay you like over a thousand dollars or something like that if they can use your battery to sort of even out the grid so if they want more energy into the into the grid, they'll take some from your battery. Um, not all of it, because you might you want it, but you know you'll tell them how much or whatever, and vice versa. If they have too much, they'll they'll stick it into your into your battery. So that's another thing, um, uh, another way you can kind of save money. They also have a program like that with EVs, which I'm on. So I I plug my EV in at night, and I've told them I wanted it at least 90% in the morning, and then they decide when it's going to charge. So it's kind of a way of evening out the grid as far as that goes. Okay, so let me um, go over these steps again. So seal and insulate your home. Step one. Step two: install a heat pump. Step three: install an electric hot, hot water heater. Step four, switch to electric landscaping equipment. Step five, switch to an electric stove, induction stove. Step six, switch your light bulbs to LEDs and use energy efficient appliances. And step seven, install solar or get your electricity from solar inland. There are some other things you can do, but you, man, if you did this, this Okay, once again, I'm just gonna go over this again. So two big steps, electrify everything and then switch to 100% renewable. If we all did that, then our species would have a chance. So, okay, cool. Well, thank you, Julia. Um, there's some other questions there. Rick, do you wanna just chime in and ask your questions that you put in the chat? Well, it was just a statement. I, I studied batteries a little bit and they were telling us about these two reservoirs and one was at a higher elevation. And when they had excess power, they pumped the water to the higher one. And then later when, when they needed the power, they would empty the water back down to the lower one and do water turbines. I thought that was pretty interesting. Cause I know yeah. that with, with, as we move to renewables, having more batteries uh, at a larger scale is, is very important for success. Yeah, absolutely. So, so pumped hydro is what they call that. So yeah, they've got two basically reservoirs at different um, heights. And then you just, uh, you know, you, you, if you have too much electricity, you pump the water out and then you pump it down. Pumped hydro is, is, is great for a couple of reasons. First of all, you're right. I mean, it's huge. I mean, how many of those little storage batteries would equate, uh, equate to that quite a bit? And then secondly, it can be used, um, uh, well, I guess 
all batteries kind of can, but it can be used a little bit at a time. So, um, you know, it's a power source sort of that can be used a little bit at a time and very quickly. So there's certain power sources like nuclear is an example. Nuclear has advantages. I'm not necessarily completely anti-nuclear or anything, but one of the problems with it is that the amount of time it takes to get started is a lot. So it can't be used to even out the grid. It only can be used as kind of a background source, you know, 20% all the time, nuclear. So it doesn't have one of the big things we want in, in electricity because, you know, if you have wind and solar, you're going to need something that, that can be come on quickly, whether it's a battery or another power system. Yeah. I Along those lines are gravity batteries. I don't know if anyone's seen videos on those, but where they've got these multi-ton concrete blocks that they lift up with cranes and you know store different height potentials. And then when they've got excess power, that's what they do. And then, they, then the idea is to lower these blocks down back through a gearbox to a turbine to generate power when you need power. And I think they're still investigating the practicality of all that, but I know there's there's several places in the world that are that are looking into that. Yeah, and another I, another. Sorry, sorry. I was just going to say I've I've heard something similar where they have a giant super heavy disc, and when they have power, they spin it up, and it's like really high tolerances and and spinning very very cleanly, and then when they need the power, they they just put like a wheel on it and and uh, make make energy that way. Oh, okay. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, another thing people do. Um, with, um, is they, they'll heat something up, whether it's sand or water or something like that. They'll, they'll heat up a huge amount of something and then they'll like store it underground in, in something and it'll actually last a very long time. And then they can use that heat um, when they need to in order to either directly heat buildings or, um, or create energy as well. Or you can do the opposite so you can you can cool, you know, cool gases. So you can cool carbon dioxide or air or something like that and use that as that. I mean, there are a lot of really, yeah, there are a lot of really clever things that people are doing. I mean, hopefully, hopefully they, you know, they find one that works. Efficiency is kind of an issue. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that while you're doing these things, you aren't losing like 90% of your energy or else, you know, but yeah, there's, there's some clever things out there. John has her hand up, and I have a question. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, uh, we have, well, your hand's up first. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to put a plug in for that induction uh, coil. Uh, actually, the one you showed, the picture, that looks like the model I bought. And it's incredible. It's one of the best purchases I've made in the last five years or so. It's uh, very fast in cooking. In fact, I burned a few things the first time because I was so used to my old pokey stove. Um, it doesn't produce the heat. I mean, and that's something's terribly appreciated in a home. You know that you know with this with these heat spells. It's a beautiful feature. Does a beautiful job of cooking. Um, fairly economical. The only reason I'm not putting it in the house, we cook it out on the patio, is that I'm probably going to be getting out of here in a year, so I don't want that investment in this place. But um, it, I, I can't say enough for it. I've really enjoyed cooking with it. Okay, well, that's that's a great endorsement, because I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know anyone who's gotten something like that, so that's great. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about it, but it, it makes sense that it doesn't put heat into the room. It puts heat directly into the pan. And, and a lot less of it, yeah. yeah. Less heat gets out directly. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, is my turn yet? Uh, so mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I went to a talk at the School of Mines at Golden and <clears throat> about you know green energy. And they were saying there are issues like the hydro pump thing. It's very inefficient. Uh, you lose a certain percentage of the of the energy, um, so that's that's one method. But you know, look at, they're trying to draw batteries that are big enough. You know, that that's problematic too because that's hard to create batteries that big to heat whole cities. 
or you know, to electrify whole cities. Um, and one of the things they were talking about is that there still have to be some fossil fuel plants running at low speed or idling, you know, that ready to gear up because you know, sometimes when, you know, when, you know, they'll say, but the wind isn't blowing and the sun ain't shining, you know. The, uh, and also, you know, to require like huge transmission lines, power lines going across the country to move to move electricity around where it's needed, where they can't get it by wind or solar at certain times. So I just I just wanted to sort of point that out. Um, you know, that is, this is what I what I heard uh, uh, through what you have what you, to comment about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I agree with all that. Um, yeah, I mean, if we're going to electrify, the, if we're going to, if we're going to power the grid on renewable energy, the whole grid of the country, first of all, we do need power lines that go from one place to another long distance in order to, because in a regional area, you may not be getting much, you know, coincidentally, you know, it's, it's cloudy and the wind isn't blowing. So, you know, what do you do at that point? Um, you know, you can put in storage, but that only lasts a certain amount of time. So yeah, very powerful um, uh, or very big, big uh, ways of getting electricity from one, one place to another. Um, and then um, what else were you saying that I wanted to comment on? Um, uh, Spinning reserves or whatever. A lot of these power companies have like turbines oh, oh, spinning, oh. right? Waiting to- Yeah, yeah. So, so, so people, a lot of times people will kind of do this straw man article, argument where they say, well, we can't get, we can't do a hundred percent renewable because, you know, in like, like 2% of the time, you know, it'll, you, the sun won't shine, the wind won't blow and you'll you, you use up all your batteries and then you'll be screwed. Um, but the truth is, you know, if we can get to 95% renewable, who cares if we have to fire up some natural gas or some biofuels yeah, or something exactly. like that? I mean, we don't have to like say, it doesn't have to be that binary, you know? I mean, we can we can get most of the way there and then be happy, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was, you know. Anyone else? Um, I'd like to. I want to invite um, Julia to talk at the Hub on November 26th at 4 p.m. if you're available. So, November 26th? Yeah. Yeah. Saturday, Saturday 11 26 at 4 p.m. Be nursing a Thanksgiving hangover. <laughs> yeah, it is two days after Thanksgiving, but uh, I don't know if that's the date of schedule or. Uh, I think I can do that. The thing is that every year, well, every other year or so, I, I go to my brothers in Princeton and it's either Thanksgiving or or Christmas. So I could tentatively say yes, but I might not be able to do it. So maybe another month or do you want me to just sort of tentatively say yes? Okay, uh, tentatively, and we still have time to schedule it um, if that doesn't work, but maybe look into that, see if that would work for you. Okay, great. Yeah, I would be, I would be happy to give, I would be happy to talk to anybody who's interested. December. And now we're booked up to uh, to November, um, but that is an opening. So okay, so we'll say we'll be, we'll stay in touch about that then. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so Julia, I think I could put Rick suggested putting your that a plug for your uh, that um, whatever that whatever the name of the, that green that green homes tour into the meetup. Um, notice online so people could come back and, and, and reference it because he's making the point that the chat unless people write it down okay. right now it's not going to get it's going to get lost it doesn't so, get kept in the recording can i can i edit that meetup notice i don't know if you just, can, just go to the meetup and put it in the comments just add it to the okay. comments and then if you've got notifications everybody will get a notification like yeah hey, yeah really made a new comment okay okay right yeah uh, it is a lot of fun though i mean i really recommend it. Okay. 
Well, thank you, Julia, for doing this. Thank okay, you thank all you for much. attending. You made it. Yes, thanks, Julia. I learned several things. It was good. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks for coming. Excellent talk. For anybody that's in Boulder, we're going over to the Rio for lunch or whatever, if you'd like to join us it's on uh, Walnut. I mean, you don't have the uh, the virtual the snack app going on. Yeah, we don't have that on yet. I don't know. Oh, haven't okay. figured that app out yet. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, but I have something at four that I need to uh, prepare for a little bit, so I won't make it. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining. And yeah, Conrad. Uh, uh, yeah. I think I noticed that when Julia was speaking, you were highlighted as the speaker. So. I'm thinking that probably the recording well, defaults is probably going to show you the whole time instead of Julia. Feedback loop. Uh, well, hopefully, it shows the slides. It was 